Welcome to Nordic Culture Point here in Kaisanyami, Helsinki. We are happy to welcome you to this book launch in cooperation with Kenno Filmi and Helsinki International Film Festival. Uh, Nordic Culture Point is an organization under the Nordic Ministers Council and we are part of the official Nordic cooperation between the Nordic regions. Uh, we administrate a large Nordic grant system for artists. We promote new and exciting Nordic culture in Finland. We facilitate networks between Nordic and Finnish artists and organizations. And we inform about the Nordic culture cooperation and their specifically their vision for 2030. And uh, the three pillars of this vision is a green Nordic region, a competitive Nordic region, which is connected to knowledge sharing, innovation, mobility, and digital integration. And uh, last but not least, which affects our work mostly, is a social sustainable Nordic region, where we promote an inclusive, equal, and interconnected region, among other things. Uh, so, therefore, it's a pleasure for us to welcome Kenno Film and HIF uh, to our house for such an event like this. And with these words, I uh, welcome you all and hand over the microphone to Hilla from the festival. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henrik. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hilla Okkonen and I'm producer at Helsinki International Film Festival, Lavan Anarchy. And this event is part of our festival program and we are very proud to be involved in supporting this kind of cultural debate and publication. Congratulations to Kenno Filmi for this beautiful work and thank you especially Dana Anangosto for putting together this event. Thank you Henrik and Nordic Culture Point for hosting this panel. I think we can start. Thank you everyone who made time to come here and thank you everyone online. Uh, thank you to all the panelists and contributors. We're in great company in all ways, both in terms of uh, authors, uh, panelists and audience. And uh, we're very, very excited to present this work uh, today. Uh, so the structure of uh, today's event will be so that we will do a brief uh, introduction uh, of uh, Keno Filmi and Takes Publication and then we will be uh, discussing with uh, each uh, of the present contributors uh, separately for about 10 minutes uh, for with each and uh, towards the end we will try to allocate 20 to 30 minutes for questions fro and comments from from you uh, online and uh, in the space. Uh, so um, we envisioned uh, takes us um, uh, continuous uh, and uh, annual publication, so we would which is something that we have not uh, uh, guaranteed yet, but uh, it will be so that we would like to do it uh, uh, after we get the responses and the feedback uh, from you. In uh, 2020, we launched an open call through which we selected 11 uh, contributors and then we invited two more contributors uh, independently. Uh, so the call was uh, uh, for texts uh, that would um, allow the, cre uh, the revisions of uh, the ecosystems in which we create and serve films and to, co to discuss the habits and the practices that take place within the film industry and address and challenge the discriminative structures that still inform the film industry today. Uh, the open call was launched with, uh, Keno Filmis, through Keno Filmis team, uh, which are my colleague Marta Tuomala here, Elena Nassen and here, and Christopher Thomas, who might be watching online. Uh, so um, the authors for takes were selected by, by an open call in spring 2020, as we, sell, and the, as we said, and the open call was inviting contributors to openly discuss and uh, uh, analyze uh, and counteract the effects uh, that this uh, uh, definitive structures have on our work. Uh, it was not only close to filmmakers, we were also inviting artists and activists and uh, researchers and everyone who works in the intersection of those, uh, as you can see in our uh, lovely uh, uh, company that we have today. So next to me is uh, Kaino Wennestrand, uh, Keisha De Silva, 
Hanan Mahbuba, Tanya Nathan, Marianne Abdulkarim, and Naga Prokriva. Uh, the uh, publication features text from other authors who are not present today, but I see one is here, Kari Ulyanala, and uh, uh, Sotiris Petridis, uh, Tuli Pentinen Lampiso, Glikeria Patramani, Eduardo Makoze Mayen, and uh, Yeli Matanli, and uh, Hilda Kahra. Uh, we want to uh, thank and give our acknowledges to our colleagues and friends uh, who work in the field of uh, moving image, education, research and advo advocacy. And we would like to express uh, the immense gratitude to all the contributors and, pa uh, and uh, panelists who trusted us with this publication and their thoughts and work. This version of Takes, this edition of Takes, is by, uh, funded by Frame Contemporary Art Finland, the promotion center for audiovisual culture AVEC, Keno uh, Filmi, uh, the Museum of Impossible Forms, and the Laboratory of Urban Commons. And today we're being hosted by the 34th uh, Helsinki International Film Festival uh, and uh, the Nordic Culture Point. Uh, so, what else we can say about Keno Filmi that um, we do um, uh, take a research oriented approach as a production company, yet our work is practice based, but we work with uh, film productions. So publications and creative programming. Uh, without further ado, I think we can start by uh, addressing our lovely panelists. And uh, in my script for the day, I was planning to start with uh, Marianne Abdul Karim. Can I just say one thing? Yeah. That people want to oh, of course. Okay, yes. Okay. Yes, if someone wants to comment from those who are joining the event uh, online, please write on our chat. Uh, our colleague from Keno Filmi, Marta Tuomala, is moderating. And please use the Nordic School to recontact. Uh, did I say that correctly? Probably, yes. And uh, here. So, yes, let's uh, start with Marianne, who is a social speaker, writer, and activist uh, interested in themes related to freedom. Uh, we will do the same process with all the authors, so first we would like you to introduce this, uh, the text that you have contributed to takes. It's a challenge because none of you, apart from Vidha, who has made this wonderful graphic design contribution, you have not read the text yet. <laughs> so it's a challenge for us all to convey the essence of uh, the essays that we will be discussing today in this uh, short time. So on its, uh, with its panelists, we would start with uh, that. Thank you, Marianne. Okay, Malu uh, and Good day, good evening. Uh, my name is Marianne Abdul Karim. And when I was um, thinking of what to write for this publication, I was thinking about my childhood uh, and how I grew up with stories. Uh, my father, may he rest in peace, um, he was a storyteller. Like, I remember when we were very young, like, he would always be telling us these stories that he made up himself. Like, there would be these characters, and he would use different sounds in explaining things, and they would have these adventures that took place uh, where he grew up and areas that were familiar to him. And it was like a lot of wordplay with the language. So, like, in a way, it was also his way of uh, teaching us our mother tongue and keeping it alive because just the ordinary way of using the language in the home, it doesn't get very rich or like complex. So telling stories was, um, yeah, it was something that really was a big part of my childhood and I love those stories and I still do and I try to keep the tradition with my own kids wh where I fail perhaps at times but then there are so many other stories competing with it which wasn't the case in my childhood because the stories that were available in the libraries or in the cinema or, you know, the stories that I had access to outside of what my dad would tell us or my mom were of different realities and it was hard to kind of like, I mean, I love them, especially the adventures that I would read, where th whether they were fantasy or other kind of uh, fictional stuff. But there was always this process of kind of understanding that this is not about me. And although I was like, you know, reading these books or like watching these series, there was this distinction, like this is not my story. This is not a story where I would fit in. This is not an adventure that I could take part in. So that's kind of like the context for the article that I wrote for this. And uh, yeah, I think that's enough because you said people haven't read it. So I will let you read it <laughs> and see if I was successful in this attempt. 
Sure. Uh, another uh, question that I had prepared for you would be how does uh, cinema intersect with uh, your work as a social speaker, activist and writer, both conceptually and in practice? That's a really good question. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, I might get up and give some books to people to look through. Yeah. Um, I mean, when we think about stories and, like, in general, what kind of stories we grew up with, I think, at least for my generation, for me personally, I grew up watching TV, and most of TV and films that I would watch were made within the U.S., and they were, you know... Uh, like now I can analyze them and say there were a lot of propaganda <laughs> involved but as a kid you're watching like you know cowboy westerns and it's like whoa but now it's like oh my god that's so horrible like the films that they would make in these stories and stuff um, but yeah like how does it intersect I mean I will think about that and I'll maybe come back to it if that's okay absolutely it's a never an easy question I mean what we do and why we do it and how it manifests and of course. Uh, what uh, else? I was thinking also that your text focuses on uh, the representations of uh, uh, minorities on screen. And there was this uh, a study by Milian Yeminen, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that you're quoting, that was uh, uh, published in this context last year. Again, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was presented at one of the panels uh, uh, in the 33rd Helsinki International Film Festival. Uh, so, um, uh, I wanted to say that meanwhile as producers uh, for films were required by the Finns Film Foundation to give some data about the backgrounds of the people that are employed in productions. So probably there is one uh, similar research for uh, below the line or backstage workers that is coming up, hopefully. If not, maybe we can uh, initiate that. And uh, yes, um, how does uh, diversity behind the camera has worked? Uh, uh, in your experience with films? Well, I don't really work in film industry, so I'm not gonna, uh, I don't know if I can answer that question based on my own experience because I've only worked in one, like two film mm -hmm. productions and they were quite different from the everyday because mm -hmm. one is what we did with Tofe Films in Uxipta Stapao, single issued incident. And that had a clear ideology behind it, how mm. it was being done and so forth. And the other one, well, I did with you, so... <laughs> 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 Clearly, it went really well. Um, but yeah, I think like for me, it's about this... Um, I don't know how I would describe it, but if you think globally mm -hmm. that able-bodied straight white men are a minority, a very small minority in the scale of the whole world, but then when we look at cinema or like these stories that we're exposed to, they come off as the main characters, as the norm, as the like, you know, everyday people, whereas everyone else is kind of pushed into the margins. And that is a bit strange to say the least, because mm -hmm. it's creating this false impression of the realities that like, you don't have to walk too far in any place in the world to see that, you know, straight white men who are able-bodied are a minority, but it's not how the cinema perceives it, like, especially I'm talking about mainstream cinema, mm -hmm. uh, that gives kind of this idea that they are the majority, they are the ones whose stories should be told, and I'm not saying that their stories shouldn't be told, I'm just saying, like, there should be some kind of, like, uh, ratio, like, how many stories do we need with Tom Hanks <laughs> to understand the depths of, you know, the, di the dimensions of what it is to be this, like, good guy, white dude kind of thing. And there are several Tom Hanks, but then you think about other people and, like, different minorities and different political minorities and how they're perceived, and it's, like, super marginalized on screen. And that's something that, I mean, it does have to change, but then when you think about resources, who has control, and that's where also the kind of like mismatch happens. So mm. it's not enough to say like, you know, we need representation, but like, how do we go about it? And like, what are the steps towards it? And to me, it feels like a long and complicated road on one level, but on the other level, it feels super simple. Like <laughs> I mean, yes. instead of talking about quotas that we need for different uh, politicized minorities, maybe discuss what kind of quota do we need for the representation of this one mm. kind of like identity. And when can we say that, you know, it's been 20 movies, so now maybe we don't have to, <laughs> again, <laughs> spend money on 
talking about this specific identity that is just as exotic as any other identity. Yes, I think it's an influence that uh, all uh, uh, that we perceive uh, in life as uh, um, I don't know, viewers and uh, practitioners and students and uh, employees uh, have uh, impacted us with. Like it's a matter of uh, what kind of resources we're exposed to in education, what other films we see being funded and distributed and being successful, which creates a paradigm for which route some filmmakers will follow for uh, pursuing success, uh, I guess. And this has all to be renegotiated and discussed and uh, addressed in a context uh, earlier in life, I think, than uh, reaching this point in our uh, professional lives that we have all been working for a few years or more than a few years and uh, we're still discussing about that. Yeah, and oftentimes it's like when you see successful people who are succeeding in filmmaking mm -hmm. industry, who are like from marginalized communities, they get that success by repeating traumas. Mm -hmm. So they have to produce trauma-filled content in order to get recognition. Mm -hmm. Like you can't do an everyday film of like very mundane things where you have different minorities present. Like that wouldn't sell. But then bring in the trauma, bring in pain, mm -hmm. suffering, and boom, we have a best-selling film. So it's like, that's another issue here. Like, it's not enough to say, like, you know, representation. Like, what kind of representation? What kind of diversity we uh, we need? And if it's okay to make, like, you know, these rom romantic comedies of specific with specific identities, can we have that with different characters, with different Absolutely. bodies, with different, like, you know, realities, and not just always be like, you know, Meg Ryan, Tom Hanks. I'm really going down <laughs> on Tom Hanks. I don't have anything <laughs> against Tom Hanks. It's just that on so many levels, he's like this very idealized, normative man character like he kind of there is a lot with that like way of presenting who and what Tom Hanks as an actor is and what kind of roles he gets and like how that kind of creates this way of seeing what a good guy yeah. is supposed to be like and it's like you would never see Denzel Washington do similar roles <laughs> for example so it's interesting uh, will it be I think that we can all uh, agree that we are anticipating for films that uh, represent and employ people who don't fit with uh, the, I don't know, sorry, Tom Hanks uh, figure. Uh, meanwhile, uh, would anyone from uh, our panel like to uh, uh, comment or ask something uh, from Marianne? Or shall we organically then move to... <laughs> Uh, to Tanya, because Tanya's uh, essay has uh, been dealing with representation from a very different angle, which is fiction. A uh, small introduction, Tanya Nathan, uh, who is here with us today, is uh, a writer, a journalist, uh, and a spoken word artist who resides in Helsinki, uh, or in the greater region of Helsinki, as he describes it in <laughs> Uh, so, yes, uh, I have been advised to introduce you very briefly and then we can go deeper into your uh, uh, positionality, maybe, and the points of view through the introduction of the text and then later through the conversation. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, I wrote this story called New World and um, I was very interested in the idea of frames and in the old masters, they very often look at the frames around the paintings to value them. And sometimes when the paintings are actually created, the frame may actually cost more than the painting itself. So I started thinking about the nature of how we put value based on how things are framed in our context, context and understandings, for example. Uh, this story was written by this author who has written these books, bestsellers, etc., etc. Or this film was made by this person. And who gets to tell the story? And how does the story get told? And all the gatekeeper principles that the stories go through. And the final product, the story that it is made, may not be the story that the storyteller in in the first place wanted to tell. And uh, as a um, self-published author, which I'm told is not a real author at all, um, I'm very aware of this process of 
in writing for journalistic backgrounds, how much is edited out, how much is you have to write to a certain tone, etc. And then when given the free hand to actually write this story, how different it was. And then having to work with an editor again, how painful it is then as a writer of color to feel like somebody's questioning your use of words and how you are telling the story. Mm -hmm. So that was very interesting. And yeah, that's what the story is a little bit about. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I wanted to continue our conversation to, uh, by discussing uh, um, the format that you picked uh, to address uh, this kind of issues, which is something that you have been doing in your previous work as a writer and as a poet and spoken word artist. Uh, uh, so you are committed uh, to decolonial practices and uh, uh, publications uh, through your own uh, um, body of work as an author, and uh, the what was the question that I will let me formulate the question? Uh, how do you see these tools uh, reflecting uh, or being useful for uh, in the context of uh, uh, if we talk about film studies, let's say, and production studies? Uh, the um, first uh, uh, route would. Uh, cover the f um, s studying of uh, films uh, in from a manner of um, uh, historical and aesthetic uh, content, while production studies would uh, discuss the uh, labor structures or the system that enables us to produce and uh, distribute films. Uh, but they're both written by scholars and academics uh, who are very rarely uh, involved in the field as practitioners themselves. So how would uh, fictive writing or poetry or uh, uh, autofiction or the blending of uh, fiction, uh, historical, uh, professional uh, experiences would uh, allow maybe for a new kind of uh, documentation and historization of uh, work in the context of uh, film, maybe art, maybe activism, maybe in this kind of context? Yes, thanks for that very simple question. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking about when I was writing this story that I was uh, walking around in, in Portugal and I remember looking at the buildings in Portugal and other people are just enjoying it from a tourist point of view, oh, beautiful building. And I'm looking at thinking, I wonder what is the history of that building I wonder who paid for that building. I wonder whose blood is in that building. And I was not able to enjoy my little afternoon stroll. And that's where the, the story started taking shape. So when somebody is writing a story and telling a story, very often the act of telling the story and getting the story out becomes very political because who gets to write the stories and who gets to tell the stories and which stories actually make it out mm -hmm. onto the big screen, onto a printed page. Because here, when I am submitting my stories, I am told that uh, there, is, there is no market for English speaking or English stories in Finland. Oh, there is no market for poetry that's written in a foreign language in this country. And I'm thinking, isn't the market the world? Mm -hmm is in their market for all stories. But then again, you are squashed into this small corner and then I, I was thinking that I, I refuse to think about the market, but you are still subject to telling your story in such a way that it gets out there. So there is that certain sort of like um, a struggle, but as a, in taking the corner practices into account, I want to tell the story from my viewpoint, coming from a post-colonial country, uh, coming from a developing country, and as a writer of color, I want to talk about those voices in creating the stories that get squashed down when looking for funding. Mm -hmm. And then talking about this process, how much of the story that gets out there has been chopped down and by who and why? That's also quite interesting. And the characters that are told in the story very often are also very much a pro uh, process that is created by the writer themselves. Yes, I think you answered this very complicated question in a very, very uh, 
uh, graceful manner, for the lack of a better word. Thank you, Tanya. It's always a pleasure to read and hear you. Uh, would uh, any of uh, my colleagues uh, on the panel would like to comment or ask something uh, from Tanya? Sorry, am I making this awkward? I will not ask again. I will just. <laughs> Okay, uh, then I, um, we could maybe go to the future is feudal and the global strike uh, trade unions and sound designers that is presented in the book on page 72 uh, by Kano Westenrand, who is an artist and a sound designer uh, who mainly works uh, with uh, text and audio and has been publishing in multiple platforms and uh, their text uh, reflects on the work of sound designers and yes, please go ahead. So I'm a sound designer. <laughs> 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 yeah. Now I know what imposter syndrome actually feels like. Uh, as if I didn't suffer from it already. No, uh, so yeah, um, I, I wrote this piece uh, about uh, class and um, design, or like, I, guess, I guess that's creative labor or uh, artistic labor, and trade unions. Um, and yeah, it's kind of a... Yeah, the text is kind of going, uh, going to a lot of different places. There's a very quick rundown of uh, 100 years of neoliberalism that we all really need to hear. <laughs> and w no, but it, uh, for the for the sake of like, how did we end up here? Because I want to, um, I guess, uh, look at why, for example, we have higher education for art because art could, could absolutely be uh, done as a vocational training. Uh, the Art and Academy link, I think, is some, some, somehow forced. You could look at the Bologna process, uh, the way European Union standardized uh, education, and I guess just I guess it was most, most like my my you know thesis in the in the text is that artists, for example, sound designers that I, that I use as an example, sound designers, uh, you know, they want to achieve a higher class status, just like engineers did in in Finland uh, 100 years ago when they want to separate themselves from. Uh, you know, uh, the kind of engineers who who didn't go to schools, but like, I guess, you know, learned by learned by trade, you know? Mm -hmm. So they, they create this trade union to protect the educated uh, engineers. And I think a lot of sound designers, you know, when the sound design uh, department was created in the 80s uh, as part of theater academy, I think p part of the reason was the same reason to like differentiate certain people from other kinds of people. In this case, technicians and you know mixers and uh, you know and, and then like place sound designers in this like more you know upper class position of like kind of close to architects and close to artists and so forth. And I think I'm also like I can I can see that in myself when I was in school. I think a lot of my just like just like myself, a lot of our, a lot of our uh, classmates uh, we kind of we're alienated by technical things and we want to be artists. <laughs> and that, you know, makes for a very poor sound designer. <laughs> I'm not gonna touch those cables. I, I don't know how to use a microphone, as you can see. So, <laughs> yeah, no, but, um, yeah, so that, something like that. Um, that's, so, but yeah, I, I, the, the reason why I'm explaining kind of the history of neoliberalism quickly in, in, in the text is to kind of, I guess, make the case for why we have this class anxiety, like where does it come from? Where are we always like striving for like an uh, upper middle class position? But I, I guess what I want to say here is that just think what would ha have happened to the, you know, to artist solidarity uh, for the working class if art education in Finland, there wouldn't be any higher education, there would only be like vocational training. Mm -hmm. Like it would be a really different art field if you would go to school with uh, uh, with people who are already getting, also getting like a secondary education, for example. And you wouldn't be in this like fancy new building in certain mm -hmm. <laughs> So I, I think it's uh, I'm again. If somebody's like, oh, so you hate art and art like uh, academic art? No, I don't. I, I think it's completely le legit to be an artist and be interested in uh, academic topic. Oh, obviously, like I don't, I don't I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, but I guess I want to like kind of drag 
uh, I just when I ask the question like why are, why are, why are, why do we have these class streams and why do designers sell these class stream class streams to clients and so forth? Sorry, that was a really long answer. I haven't been in a panel for like four years. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> And you have almost covered everything that we have in our notes here, but uh, mm -hmm. we can uh, improvise. And uh, sure. uh, yes, that sounds great. Uh, so uh, let's go from uh, uh, in reverse, actually. We will start from the ending of the text with uh, which, uh, spoiler alert, uh, calls for uh, uh, um, for the organization and uh, through unionizing. Uh, from your experience uh, uh, and I don't know who else has attended, uh, of maybe your experience as well in the audience, uh, Finnish ac art academies. Uh, do, these, uh, do the local art universities present uh, the possibili this possibility to the students and in what context? And um, as we were saying before a little bit with uh, Marianne as well, that uh, uh, we, uh, how should I say it, uh, that uh, we didn't receive much um, how should I say that? Much guidance about working life or about other prospects of our um, professional life and practice uh, through education uh, in that time, at least. Or maybe now it's a bit uh, differentiated. But yes, I was very curious to know how uh, work uh, payments, uh, collaborations, uh, mediations between co, co workers and unions uh, would have been presented uh, to you as a student uh, in the Arts Academy. Sure, yeah, well, uh, in the text I actually mentioned that um, the representative from the Finnish uh, Light, Sound and Video Designers uh, Trade Union came to our school um, and I, you know, immediately joined up uh, like you should and then I went to the, you know, the, the I served on the board of, of that union and the kind of umbrella union mm -hmm. for the other media workers. Um, so, you know, there's that, you know, the, the that, that's, uh, that's something that you bump into when you're in school. Um, but yeah, I guess I was lucky that I had teachers who, you know, didn't, you know, beat around the bush and just like said how things are going to be, you know, mm -hmm. and were, th they weren't trying to sell me a dream, which I'm really happy about. I, I'm, I'm really critical of this idea of selling this upper middle class dream to people who go to art school because most of them will end up poor, as we know. And it's, uh, you know, of course, everyone's situation is different. I, I think there's been research being made about Finnish artists and their cla class backgrounds, mm -hmm. and quite often, people who are successful as artists, they have familial wealth, they have like you know uh, networks to begin with. Uh, but that's another issue. Um, but I guess, yeah, it's it's the, 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 the kind of the problem I have with trade unions and artists is that it's really hard to put artists in a box and say that. Well, let's. Uh, well, I, I give an example. When I was like a first year student, we went to a theater in Tampere, uh, and there was this person who gave us a tour, uh, uh, a sound designer, sound technician. I don't know what their like actual title was, and they told us that, yeah, they were working on this upcoming play, and they had to create as many cues as possible. So if there's a scene with like thunder and rain, that's two cues because there's thunder and rain because they were paid by the amount of cues. So okay. the, the more cues you would have, the more, you know, kind of uh, challenging the work is for the, for, the, for the worker. So then they got like ask for more pay, very simply put. So uh, that was a, one example of like seeing real world uh, negotiations. But, but I'm giving this example mm. of like, how hard it is to like, uh, I'm not sure if, like I don't know, Marta will hate me for this, but I'm not sure if, if art is a job in in like any like uh, like I think I'm, I'm still struggling with that. I think there's a lot of like I think I think that's a, that's still a discussion to be had, like how much artist uh, like being an artist kind of falls neatly into the box of like I, I this is something that I always struggle with in the unions. Like we had so hard time like doing the negotiating contracts and there's like, for example, Teme, the Finnish Theatre Media Art Union, I know that they are trying to figure out how to do contracts and uh, other other services for freelancers. And especially like, you know, kind of independent artists who don't have a very strict profession. Like I, I never had a strict profession. I've done a lot of things. So, you know, and in my, in my text, I'm trying to explain this history of uh, trade unions and what they do and what they don't do. And I'm not sure if, if they can respond to the question at hand globally. And, you know, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just being kind of a mess about this whole thing right now, but just throwing stuff out. 
And I'm sure that many people will want to comment on that. Just no hate. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have kind of relevant questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I'm sure we will return to that a bit later. Uh, yeah, it's tricky. Yes. Uh, shall we introduce Keisha da Silva, uh, who is a PhD student in uh, social psychology at the University of Helsinki and has contributed to our publication with uh, the text uh, called uh, Which Women, Whose Issues? on page six. Hi. So um, basically, uh, I've been looking in my research at how power and ideology intersect in gender justice advocacy in India. And it got me really sort of interested in sort of how hierarchies are sort of maintained and replicated in gender advocacy. And uh, what actually got me interested in this topic to, to begin with was probably back in 2020. Uh, India was named the most dangerous country in the world for women, according to a Thomas Rauder's Foundation survey. Now, obviously, that naming, that classification was something quite political because um, it was a perception poll based on uh, the opinion of people considered experts in the field of gender um, and who were asked to rate different countries along different parameters uh, along how they were perceived to be dangerous for women. And India was considered or perceived to be most dangerous in terms of human trafficking, uh, sexual violence, as well as uh, cultural practices. Um, then in the wake of that classification, uh, uh, and generally in the last 10 years or so, because also back, I think, in 2011, India was, I think, came fourth in that same poll. Um, so there was a huge proliferation of uh, gender advocacy uh, from different organizations in India that claimed to be empowering women. But it wasn't really talked about which women and what issues were kind of going to come to the forefront through this advocacy. So I started looking at campaigns from different organizations, uh, kind of broadcast through their YouTube channels. And uh, what kind of struck me was this kind of pattern. First of all, how whether it was an, a government organization, whether it was a non-governmental organization uh, at a sort of local level or an international non-governmental organization, they seemed to be kind of uh, uh, first of all, the most talked about issue was sexual harassment. And then with sexual harassment, the sort of prototypical victim of sexual harassment was shown in these videos to be um, a young upper middle class to middle class uh, Indian woman in a cityscape targeted usually by um, rural uh, migrant working class men. Um, and uh, on the flip side of that, the other issues that were shown on a less sort of, uh, in not quite the same volume, were female infanticide as well as female education. And with those issues, they were kind of shown um, to be issues of rural India. So not something that happened in urban areas, something explicitly involving rural women caused by the rural community. And, uh, these, this is a pretty problematic depiction for a number of reasons. Firstly, a lot of research suggests that women who face sexual harassment, it's not, re or most often the common scenario is not really a stranger emanating from a dark alleyway. It's usually people, men they know, uh, colleagues, friends, relatives, um, acquaintances, and um, the second thing is that usually sexual harassment and rape they are things that um, are issues of power and authority and abuse of power and authority very often. So usually the women who are targeted are women who are the most marginalized. And so in India, it's women at the bottom of caste and class hierarchies who are overrepresented in sexual harassment and gender-based violence statistics. And yet they are not the ones we are seeing in these videos. They are not the ones we are seeing in news uh, generally about sexual violence in India. And uh, th the final thing is also that uh, female infanticide and female education, they are not something confined to rural India. They're very much also issues that are happening in urban areas among upper middle class families. And um, 
the sort of, uh, for instance, sex, uh, female infanticide stems from sun preference, which in turn stems from uh, uh, cultural and religious desires to maintain wealth. So there's very much a natural proclivity to upper middle class to middle class families in India maintaining these practices. Uh, and yet they are sort of cast as rural issues. And I think the reason why this is happening to a great extent is because middle to upper middle class people are overrepresented in gender advocacy organizations. So they're the ones producing these issues. Uh, they're the ones producing the campaigns so they are more likely to talk about issues that affect them and kind of show a blindness to um, issues outside of them. And also the people who can donate to these campaigns are also upper middle class people to middle class. So the, they have a kind of, the organizations have a natural tendency to kind of appeal uh, in way to messages that, that are kind of consistent with middle class morals and values and sympathies because they're the ones who are giving them the funds. Yes. Thank you, Keshia. Uh, I wanted to ask you how you are in conversation or not with such uh, uh, advocacy groups and centers or NGOs in your research and for what uh, reasons yes and for what reasons no. So at the time uh, I started this research, I was specifically interested in, first of all, looking at like the content of the campaigns, but then also I wanted to talk to with the people producing them, as well as to kind of show some of these campaigns to the masses in India to kind of find out what their reactions are to these campaigns and whether they see them as kind of pro promoting an actual consistent image with their realities. And um, uh, now I've finished analyzing the content material and I've sort of been in dialogue with some of the producers to hopefully start collecting interview material and hopefully that'll be the next part of my study. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. That's uh, another topic I'm sure we will come to uh, in the question section. And uh, if uh, we can continue with uh, Aga. Aga's contribution to takes is uh, an interview with a uh, collective uh, uh, called uh, uh, Black Films Matter and under the title uh, I Can't Tell the Stories. And uh, maybe we can ask by, uh, we can start by uh, the um, context in which uh, you got in touch with this collective and uh, how they uh, had published an open letter or a uh, public letter as uh, an invitation and uh, how this uh, communication proceeded from there. Thank you. Um, maybe first I should start about my background because it has uh, a little bit to do with that. Because however, I see myself as a person working with multimedia that also includes uh, film and video. And um, while working with those those media, I reflect quite a lot how we use them, how we collaborate with other people, and uh, the proportions sometimes of my work, whether I'm working with those media or more how we actually collaborate. They kind of over years uh, change quite a lot. And uh, I am especially um, interested in decentralized uh, methods of working together um, you know, people call it differently, you know, participatory, collaborative. Uh, I call it decentralized, but <laughs> yeah, it could be another kind of two hours. Uh, what's, what do we mean actually by that? And um, when I responded to the call um, for the takes publication, I wanted to reflect on those modes of working uh, within film industry. Mm. And for me at that moment, I have to admit, it was quite vague, like what would be my case study, what I will focus on exactly. And uh, then I got like a green light, yes, yes, like uh, write it. And um, Black Lives Matter happened. And um, to, to me, it was quite... Um, I felt strongly I want to somehow... Uh, use this or like ref like um, respond to the moment which was happening right now to kind of uh, investigate uh, through through that very time you know over one year ago uh, on how films are made 
And uh, actually, somewhere I found a letter written by this collective Black Films Matter uh, on like a critical reflection on on filmmaking and black representations in movies and uh, I treated this uh, this statement as a as an invitation for the discussion and I simply contacted those people who were behind that initiative hey would you like to to chat with me about like um, their per their perspective on working uh, in film and uh, it appeared to be two people based in London um, who are working in TV and film industry. And um, this text uh, in this publication is just a, a, like a trans transcription, basically, of our conversation. Um, the issues I was like uh, mostly uh, facing was that, on one hand, we were uh, all kind of buzzing up with certain emotions which appeared with this uh, kind of uh, emergence of Black Lives Matters uh, because of the events and, and which were happening right back then and, uh, and the media. And kind of um, also being aware that when there is this kind of eruption of, of attention and, and anger and so on, there is this particular energy going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very different if we talk about long-term kind of uh, processes. So for example, um, I don't know, I will not tell you, but if you, are, if you read the interview and you are curious what happened with their initiative, you can check it online. But uh, it's quite interesting also to reflect on that from one year later over. Uh, and I was facing also this issue of like, uh, do I actually have a right to write this text? Why it should be, be me? Um, that's why I just decided to choose the strategy in which I am just the least present possible. I kind of give the space which was like uh, reserved for that, for that reflection. And, and here it is. Um, so uh, I think. That's that's for, for for the introduction to this to this interview. Yes, uh, and uh, I wanted to ask you if you wish to elaborate on your work as a mediator in social tools or in other uh, uh, organizations or affiliations you are uh, taking part in, and if you have worked with filmmakers and uh, how was your experience uh, with that, if so, mm. or if this is something that you're planning on doing in the future. Or I think that. Um, I mean, I've been working mostly with uh, with uh, structures and like uh, of working together mostly within like a generally understood arts, which like as some of you might know, the structure of working within arts is kind of loose and undefined very often. So there is a lot of space to question it and yeah, let's come up with new methods and let's test it. And I was kind of uh, interested to uh, see films as one of the kind of a genre of arts or crea creative field where the structure of working is actually much more certain. It's like very hor like a top to down and um, I was curious to observe that, like, uh, can we actually redefine it? It's on something also we talk in the in this interview mm -hmm. um, because, uh, yeah, there there are certain opinions on this topic. Because if we have a structure, like, do we really need to redefine it? It's just maybe about what we feel the structure with and so on. But um, yeah, I have mostly an experience with working with uh, non-structures and trying to structurize mm -hmm. them because I believe that if there is no structure, then anyway, some structure will appear and most likely we will not like it. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, um, yeah, that's, that's my background. Yeah. Both with social tools, which is like a, a festival on decentralized organizing within culture and um, and I've been also uh, co-producing two decentralized uh, like um, project spaces in Helsinki, but they don't exist anymore. So you could also think how successful those methods were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
if I can comment, yes, there is structure in the filmmaking, but it uh, tends to be abusive and it's certainly militaristic, so the fact that we have a structure is not necessarily uh, something that we should hold on to. Uh, but yes, my last question to you would be, uh, what do you learn as a um, mediator or a person who works with decentralized uh, practices by interviewing collectives and if, if this is something that uh, you would consider continuing doing as a method for learning and also sharing practices. Again, referring to this interview, which is which is in the publication, because it's all like a, something which we can hold in our hands and, and maybe read at some point. Um, I think generalizations are very uh, dangerous because uh, I talked here in this text with two people um, who would represent uh, like a black filmmaking field, let's say, uh, but I would be very far away from thinking that, okay, this is the opinion and this is how we build around that. I think that it is really something which I wish, including me, um, to be very, very sensitive on, uh, like generalizing based on like uh, some single conversation. Mm -hmm. Oh, I read this article and this is how it is. Uh, so this is much more complex uh, than that, and um, mm, including various voices, even if we talk about, yeah, black film. So it has to be quiet, like uh, it has to have a one certain problem and we will face it. I think this is very, very, very tricky. So generalizing, very uh, something I would, I would really try to go away from and Maybe another thought which comes to my mind is about um, taking small steps mm -hmm. and thinking about big changes in, in those steps. It's almost like, you know, if we think um, on, on personal level, when we try to work on something which is more long term, it's sometimes so overwhelming to, to, to just think of the idea of, of something so big but then to put it apart and think how it can go with few steps and thinking even that these steps could go beyond our lifetime like uh, of a of a per of a single person mm -hmm. because those change are have to be so deep and so long, so long term it can be very frustrating but it's something i think uh i would wish to to be more accepting towards too that some yes. things can be just taking a little bit more time than one lifetime. Absolutely. And uh, if we want to conclude uh, our uh, introduction to the panelists and the text with uh, Hanan Bahpupa, and uh, Hanan is uh, contributing with a text called Pieces of Progress in Progress, which you can find in page 21. Hanan is a uh, writer, director, and producer, or filmmaker, uh, for a shorter uh, introduction. <laughs> Uh, so, Hanan, can you please tell us a little bit about uh, your text and maybe we can then discuss the process and the format of it because it's quite particular in relation to all the other texts that we have uh, in this uh, collection. Sure. Um, hi. Um, so, in this piece, I wanted to sort of talk about um, how artifice masquerades as reality, especially in uh, documentary filmmaking and specifically in uh, branded content documentary style filmmaking, otherwise known as commercials. So these, these kinds of video documentaries that are comm commissioned by clients have one purpose, which is to show the, the client or the customer in, uh, like an al as an altruist, like in a positive light, where, like for example, like in this text, I have a, a big social media company that has um, taken, that is supporting a small local business. So like, for example, you can have like a, a local cafe that is now thriving because they've been able to advertise on this big social media's platform. So it's a small business success story. Um, so in my years living in New York as a documentary producer, I had a lot of experience producing this kind of content and it's largely very formulaic, uh, scrubbed of nuance, of spontaneity, kind of like the opposite of what you would think of with documentary filmmaking itself. 
Um, so in this text, I have a fictional social media company, a fictional production company, and a fictional small business. And they're all sort of working together to create this video. And um, it was very important for me to have a very particular sort of visual method for, for sh sharing this story. You'll see there are uh, screenshots of Gmail, of Slack, of transcripts, etc. because I really wanted to show that it's kind of, it's, it's a business model and a very like tight mode of production that again has nothing to do with sort of a slow unfolding that you might expect mm. from documentary. Um, another element that I wanted to bring up in this text was ownership of the narrative. So mostly when we would do these kinds of videos, the basis of this script, so to speak, is um, an interview with the small business owner or whoever's being uh, interviewed there. And it's generally like at least an hour, hour and a half, something like that. And so the transcript ends up being like 60 to 80 pages, like quite a lot of text, but it needs to be distilled down into 60 seconds, which is quite a lot to sort of cut through. Um, so the process would be, we're just like sort of scrubbing through it, highlighting bits that might sound good, might make the client sound like the big hero that it is in their eyes. Um, and then copy and pasting all those. It can even be as extreme as taking the start of one sentence and then Frank inviting it onto the end of another. And yeah, so 60 pages to less than a page is quite a lot of control for the production company to have over this story. And never once is the um, is the speaker shown this text or asked like, what do you think of this? It's really taken away from their mouth, even though that's its origin. Um, so I mean, I, I, I don't want to pretend like it's just a, a black and white issue because oftentimes the small businesses can be very happy to have a high production value free commercial that they can use as they wish. But um, my purpose in writing this text was to sort of show the behind the scenes and critique it. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction, Hanan. Uh, as we spoke with Tania earlier as well, how do you think that this kind of, uh, um, in your in your case it's fictional, but it can be something, uh, it could be part of someone's notepad or some, uh, uh, I don't know, kind of uh, uh, Journal in our archiving method of uh, uh, the work that uh, we conduct. Uh, how can this material maybe uh, reformulate themselves into uh, production studies material that emerges from uh, filmmakers and not by academics in a sense? Or it doesn't have to be used in that context, or it doesn't doesn't have to be named in that context, but. Uh, something that can be used within uh, the filmmakers' communities for the further uh, development, both in professional and also in critical ways uh, for uh, uh, our own uh, sake of uh, understanding each other and uh, uh, the work that we do. Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> in a way, what I'm trying to do is make a fake documentary myself in the thing, mm -hmm. a, a written one. Um, I, I think what I wanted to do was show how it operates rather than talk about it. Mm -hmm. So in that way, I guess it it does show a process that is real. And I think that you're able to sort of see the steps behind it in a different way when you're seeing how the production companies and clients are communicating. And it's very, um, I guess, how do I say this? Like takes aside all those like good intentions that mm. they're papered over with. Like on the surface, they can be like, look, we're showing this um, person of color run business, aren't we so great? But then it's like, it's a very calculated thing and it shows sort of what the decisions were in making those and that they are very intentional with a purpose that has nothing to do with you know, justice or whatever. But um, yeah, I, I guess the tools are what are used. So then they're relevant to the, the critique of how we make films. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so the book is uh, compiled of 13 texts. All of them are quite uh, intense and rich, as you might have uh, figured out uh, by now. So we will be posting it uh, on our website, uh, kenofilmy.com, and we will be cross-posting with uh, the Helsinki International Film Festival as well, and will be accessible free of charge to download as PDF. 
We have printed a few copies that are available here uh, for a um, price of 15 euros per copy to cover our printing expenses. Uh, and if somebody needs to have them in, the well, wants to have them in a, a book format, you can also message and contact us and we can arrange uh, uh, something for you. Uh, I am sure there are many comments and many questions, both from between the panelists and also from the audience here and online. So now it's six o'clock, we have about 30 more minutes and I would like to open it up for, uh, for you. Really? Oh, uh, sh yes, sure. Thank you, Hanan. Yes. Hi. <laughs> Thank you all for the uh, wonderful presentations, and like it, we're very excited about getting to read the publication soon. My question is more towards the editorial. I'm just an anonymous commenter. <laughs> So um, just to, the question was mm -hmm. more for, for the editorial group. Mm -hmm. So because it's usually like a, a within the film context, but you're working with people who come from many different backgrounds mm -hmm. and positions. So, so what do you think these are the contribution of all these voices towards the film industry? So a little like, what is this publication aiming to bring and what? Yes, I can move the mic around. Yes. How does it, uh, these multiple voices insert mm -hmm. into, into the field of film? Yes, uh, I'm just standing up to pick up the mic as well. I will be, but maybe Marta wants to say something as well, or Ellen, I can also say, but I have been talking for quite a long time. So yes, okay. Now, uh, as we were commenting with uh, Aga before, I think that the way that we are getting educated and uh, uh, learn how to professionalize ourselves within the field of filmmaking is very standardized and uh, uh, that it lacks the pl plurality of uh, uh, points of view that uh, um, comments and contributions of uh, people and communities who have been working with film, but not only with film, or have some uh, other uh, interests and uh, backgrounds in which uh, then intersect uh, with uh, the field that we to which we're reflecting and uh, we're studying uh, in the context of this publication and our work uh, as producers, uh, can uh, really open up conversations and uh, possibilities to uh, revise our education curriculum, to revise our uh, working methodologies, uh, what the expectations are from our employers, what do we do as employers when we have the power, how much space we take, how much space we share, how m and uh, to renegotiate all these responsibilities uh, and learn from our mistakes, I guess, or the things that we don't know uh, how to navigate always. Uh, do my colleagues from Ken of Filmy want to say something? Well, I kind of agree to what Danai has already told, but uh, also this said uh, that when I think of like doing films and audiovisual works as a visual artist, and there is always like, I kind of at least think that um, still when I'm thinking of like film industry, that there are certain kind of rules in it and hierarchies that I even myself sometimes don't really understand. So, so to kind of open these questions in a wider sense, um, I think that is the aim here too. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, does anyone from the audience have any questions or shall we check the online? Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for an uh, excellent evening of conversations. There's definitely a lot to think about um, and a lot to respond to because so many of you have said so many interesting things and, and things uh, worth connecting and thinking about. Uh, but just as a <coughs> question, I'm um, wondering, because we're talking about this uh, idea of structuring and mm -hmm. hierarchies, and we're talking about um, 
the film industry in a sense operating with a certain kind of a structure that almost is a formula in itself just taking from what uh, hanan mm -hmm. was talking about um what are your um thoughts or methods for breaking those formulas of structures uh, are there any kind of other non hierarchical or uh, democratic structures that can still be followed while working uh, that give maybe a certain kind of um, as you were saying uh, a decentralization but at the same time a kind of a, a methodology for operating uh, in a non non structured way thank you for the easy question i will <laughs> quote my colleague tania here <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, we uh, observe that we are in a critical juncture in production culture where many um, uh, representatives, uh, both people, uh, structures, companies that uh, were the status quo a few years ago and their methodologies and their ways of being and uh, working and negotiating space or abusing power. Uh, where the norm, uh, this seemed to have been uh, challenged uh, and dethroned at the moment. Uh, but still there are a lot of things to open up and uh, critique and uh, analyze and counteract as uh, participants and practitioners uh, in the field of filmmaking. Uh, as Saga said, it's not a matter of a few years of change. It will take uh, a while to see the changes happening and uh, already what we can observe is that there is a shift uh, uh, both through the quotas but also through the interest of certain uh, programmers and certain uh, festival curators that these uh, topics are being uh, um, hosted in the context of films, uh, from film festivals, which are uh, key industry events and uh, reach out to several people uh, in that way. Of course, this is a self-published uh, publication, but it did have the support of several funders and institutions, um, other more... Um, traditional for the lack of a better world or for lo more long-term standing in uh, Finland. Again, in the context of both uh, filmmaking and art, we had received support from AVEC and uh, HIF that are film uh, entities, and we also had received support from FRAME, which is uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, focusing on visual arts, if I'm not mistaken, until recently or until now. Uh, so yes, there is a space to have these discussions uh, for now. Uh, um, there are possibilities to study films in different contexts or to learn from each other or to host uh, uh, more kind of uh, gatherings uh, where we negotiate this, uh, uh, how should I say it, uh, any frustrations that we might have or any limitations that we observe uh, uh, in the field. Uh, but also this is very much linked to access, to funds. I mean that uh, there are certain glass ceilings that uh, need to be addressed as well, which uh, are in relation to the um, uh, film funds and what, what the criteria are there. Uh, then again, when working with uh, certain um, uh, colleagues who have been uh, uh, in the industry for a longer time, they might have uh, incorporated this uh, system of work uh, as a a coping mechanism or a survival structure in order to advance in the careers and this is also a difficult conversation to have uh, uh, as a sector and yes i don't think that there will ever be a very specific um and i mean like a, um, a solution where everyone will be equally happy with uh, but uh, in the smaller productions as uh, and uh, more um, um as you say, the productions that Marian was mentioning, for instance, that we are, are more sc smaller scale and uh, between a certain group of people, these are spaces in which we have more opportunities to uh, work in a manner that is not uh, abusive, for the lack of a better word. And uh, But yes, I think it's uh, it will take some time and some methods and tools to develop uh, in collaboration with other fields and with uh, other knowledges uh, in order to have something that we can apply into bigger scale projects, if we still need to have blockbuster films. Haha. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyone else uh, from Kenno who would like to answer to that? Okay, thank you, Marta. Yes. Mm. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Ali, for the question. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I go back a bit to what Aga was saying uh, about, uh, you know, changes that take more than a lifetime. I think instead of, I mean, in addition to looking to uh, looking at the future, I, I think we should also look at the past and see what has worked. And I think that's why I'm writing about trade unions because they have a very you know uh, fantastic history. And they are, I mean, obviously there's a lot of really good work being done in in Finnish trade unions. Uh, but whenever I post about it, or when I was still in social media, when I would post about so, uh, the importance of trade unions, quite often artists would ask me, uh, um, like so. Where should I join? And if you're a visual artist, if you're a fine artist, there are no unions in Finland that would really like suit your needs. And quite often, people don't know uh, what is what. Like, for example, the Finnish Artists Association is not a union; it's just, you know, a club for artists. Basically, they have no political leverage. And I think this is the key. Like, do you have political leverage or not? And for example, the Theater and Media uh, Workers Union, to which I belong, is part of uh, SAK, which is one of the biggest uh, Finnish unions. So I think we should look at those, like we should look at what, what has already worked. Now, of course, there's, like, there's obviously a lot of problems with like uh, social justice movements, to, uh, trade unions, whatever. You, there's always something that is not really working for what you're doing or might have problems. But I, I, I think I've always wanted to, like when I uh, speak to people who are, let's say, like starting up with these kind of issues, then I'm sure a lot of people who have been doing some kind of like something along these lines, this kind of work or activism, there's always the feeling like, oh, this comes as again, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. isn't there any, like, can we, like, just attach a USB stick to everyone's head to, like, upload the firmware of, like, what happened before <laughs> so we don't have to start again? I mean, this is ridiculous because what happens, of course, is that then when you get older, you become this, like, really boring person who's like, well, we tried that, you know, it's so, of course, you have to be curious about what's going on, but also offer what you know already. And I guess this exchange is super, super important, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I believe in looking at what has worked before, but I also believe in like being humble in the fact that you don't know what's good happening right now. Mm -hmm. Sure. And also those who are uh, still watching online, you can uh, type your comments to the Nordisk uh, Culture Contact uh, chat. Please go ahead, Aga. I agree very much with what you said. But um, I'm also thinking about ability to, to phrase the problem. I think that, for example, Me Too. Like you say Me Too, everybody knows what is it mm -hmm. about. And there is no way back like of course there's still a lot of abuse it's still not yet there but you cannot like pretend that you kind of oh i missed that okay what is this like mm -hmm. uh, no way the same with uh, black Lives matters like uh, it's really it's such an iconic moment and it's really it became so media present that there is no way to pretend that uh, it is not an issue and i think that the question is so what's next? What, what, what's, uh, what other problem? And I think if we are born to seek structures, it's sometimes so difficult to verbalize in mm. a one word, one tag, or three words, what's the problem? And what's, what's, what's the kind of a mark that, that we cannot kind of uh, come back to what it was, that it's never going, it, it's never going to be the same. And I think it's really, it's really super difficult to spot what exactly is the problem which cannot be ignored anymore with this kind of clarity. Mm -hmm. I can jump, jump in there and uh, say that uh, I think there needs to be, in decentralizing, more access to the space, the space, the framework, where we're talking about issues, where we're talking about what's happening. But realistically, to get access to that space, you need to have the know-how to get access to that space. Mm -hmm. How do I get to where decision makers are talking? How do I have the funds? Because we need to eat. We can't basically just pay our bills with visibility. We need to know the language in which the conversation is going in. And we need to have ability and know-how from people who have experience in the game to get access to grants to have the language of grant writing. And as we discussed, I think, was it a couple of weeks ago, that many of the grant 
processes also count on the fact that you have an academic background to mm-hmm. get into that grant writing process. So how do you circumspect, how do you go around this? So I'm, I'm kind of very interested in creating uh, uh, structures, creating groups, so that other voices are heard. And that's how you can decentralize in one way. Of course, there are many other ways you can do it, but this is one thing that's interesting. If you have the leverage, then pull somebody else up mm-hmm. and so on. Absolutely. There was some movement there. Yes, hey, Elham. Hi. Thank you so much for the this panel talk and the publication, which I am looking forward to reading. Uh, I have a question. It's kind of like I'm asking from everyone if anyone has any thoughts about this. Uh, there's this kind of thing that has been bothering me lately, and it's watching uh, festivals, different festivals, uh, who are starting this kind of trend of allocating a specific, you know, like prize or a section for uh, showing films from BIPOC filmmakers. For example, this Amplify Voices mm-hmm. prize in Toronto, or this year I noticed Love and Anarchy has uh, kind of done a similar thing, this AMP award, just to you know, to uh, give a prize to one filmmaker of color. And in a way, I do see it kind of as breadcrumbing <laughs> BIPOC filmmakers. And, you know, to, to, like, why not include them in the main competition? Why not give them, put them in the same spotlight where you put, like, uh, white filmmakers? And... I don't know, like this kind of, I was thinking, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? You know, like I want to know other people's opinion on this. Because I see many people cheering for these kind of things happening, but at the same time, I don't necessarily see it as a good thing. So I just wanted to know it all. We're being hosted by a festival, so who wants to answer that? <laughs> Since I have the mic. Want to give me the mic? It's all over. Um, Kadar Ahmed, a, a wonderful, amazing filmmaker, uh, Finnish Somali background. He said it's interesting how, in some places, he's Somali, <laughs> and in some places, he's Finnish. Sometimes he's Finnish Somali, but very often he's Somali. He's a Somali filmmaker. So where, where do you, or do you then just point rudely to who funded it, <laughs> his film? Uh, and so on. It's an interesting question of framework and, or is it just bread coming? Well, I think as long as we have a gendered crisis in filmmaking, like best female lead, best male lead, then let's just add up to the categories or then get rid of the categories Mm -hmm. entirely. But like there are already existing categories like first film, short film, docu- like there are so many different categories. So then if they add, and I think the one that you mentioned that's now being, uh, or was it, th- did that word already go? It's with the Helsinki Film Festival, this like uh, up and coming filmmakers of my book background. So it's for a very specific group <laughs> of filmmakers. It's not general filmmakers. And at the same time, if you are someone who's a filmmaker in Finland and happen to be BIPOC, then of course you're going to be in the main category also. Like it's not to say like, you know, you're excluded from this because now you have this category. Uh, there are other uh, reasons for <laughs> why in the mainstream. Yeah, yeah, but that's a different conversation, like who has access and to what, as to what kind of categories exist for the prices. So I'm just saying that, you know, if we have categories, then let's just, you know, add more categories to them, or then decide that we want to move away from the categories. Because, I mean, if it's acting, uh, why do we need gendered uh, kind of like categories? Like we could get rid of gender entirely, but that's not happening yet. So, um so yeah, I think we should fake equality until we get there, but then at the same time, it's like the system is already working this with certain logic, and this new prize, it's, it operates within that same logic. So if we want to change the system, then let's change the whole thing, but not just target what is happening with like you know, politicized minorities. 
because in some ways that is a step forward, although it feels like a step backwards. It's uh, it's complex, but yeah. Also, I'm not sure about that, but I think that the way that uh, the programs in uh, which uh, the films are screened are not uh, separated uh, from the main competition or but from. Why not? I didn't mean yeah. to attack like Lawan <laughs> and Ivy. No, 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 no. Because no. these kind of things, when I was working in Ampi, we would get this kind of offers from different festivals that, hey, we can you know, allocate this section for you. But you're like, why not have our films in the main competition, like uh, selected in the main competition? So they can be like. Because I thought that way they could be seen more, mm -hmm. but not to hey you know here you have this small space take mm -hmm. it and be happy with it and you know let us move on. So is the situation that for um, if you are a filmmaker of uh, that black or brown background, you are not allowed in the main category? Is not that what allowed, you're saying? Or but kind of it is harder for you to get in. I think this like. Okay, well, I have a different understanding of this, so I think there's also this, like, because I didn't, uh, I didn't think that it's related to that, that you cannot enter the other categories because of this, but I will have no, to maybe you, you read more enter, about it. And but yeah, I think it's more, uh, you're not as favored to get in. in yeah. 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 If I can comment on what Seppi Day is saying, it's of course, and uh, Elham brought it up earlier, that it's access to education, which is not uh, uh, favoring uh, uh, people of uh, diasporic or BIPOC uh, backgrounds so in Finland and many other places as well. I think that film funds are very bound to uh, nationalist identities as well. And uh, this is something that we're aiming to uh, address and discuss and challenge through all these activities that uh, we are having uh, and the activities that are to follow in the generations of filmmakers that will come after us, I guess. But uh, yes, it's a matter of uh, resources maybe and what kind of production um, um, inequalities there are between different communities and how easy it is to get uh, uh, trusted with a certain amount of uh, space or money or uh, visibility in order to uh, show your film in a wider audience. I don't want to use the word big festival because it's not just about that, I think. May I comment on this? I think um, somewhat I agree with Mariam because it creates some sort of normalizing. As long as, and I agree with you, because if it remains forever that there is this category and mm -hmm. it doesn't move forward, then it becomes very problematic. In terms of normalization, I personally think it is a good initiative as long as it goes, moves forward, that networking happening and people yes. get used to this matter and it's not only a category as a bubble in there mm -hmm. and it can be a step for, uh, going up and up. This is the, the way I see it. Yeah, and I certainly agree with you all in the way that we came around the argument uh, now. Comment. Yes, of course. Yeah, I think this, go this goes back to what Ali was asking about uh, structures, because uh, for you know, some reason or the other, we in art are not immune for the same uh, sort of <laughs> oppressive structures that that happen in in, in in everywhere in society, and we want to uh, we want to create winners and we want to create losers. And you can't have you know winners without losers. As our uh, mayor said, Johanna Vartian a few years ago, that if everyone would have a job, that would be a catastrophe because how would you leverage them to make like you know jobs with really low pay? And that's why we have unemployed people, you know. So there would be competition. And I'm always like surprised that in the arts we are so happy to uh, copy these models of, co of competition and creating winners and losers. It's like, meritocracy doesn't work. We can't all like just advance infinitely. The, like if you, if you listen to sociologists, the best uh, solution usually is to bring the people down from, from the higher echelons and then bring people uh, uh, up from the uh, lower uh, stratum of society, but you can't just keep creating winners. Like, it's it's very problematic. Of course, like in this, this might sound a little, you know, ignorant in this in this particular con context. But I just want to like broaden the scope of like 
what kind of systems we create as artists, uh, just to complicate this even more. more. <laughs> Yes, I think that uh, uh, reflecting on the discussions that we have been having earlier is that uh, we don't want to replicate the system anymore. Uh, and uh, yes, I think we have time for a few more uh, remarks or uh, questions uh, before we end this uh, conversation. Yes. Um, I, I agree with what both of you are saying. It does feel a little bit about like breadcrumbing, but then maybe it's a step. But then I guess I'm sort of thinking it's also possible to do what they're claiming to do without shouting about it, like just to include more filmmakers of color. But then you don't have to, I don't know, say that this is what we're doing and this is the reason why we're doing it. And then again, you can also argue against that, that then they're trying to promote the filmmakers of color. So it, it's complicated, but yeah. Ali, uh, were you raising the, the, the sea right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's not a new question. Maybe it's just a continuation, if if nobody minds. Um, <clears throat> because I was just thinking. I mean, just to throw a wrench into this conversation, mm -hmm. we're talking about categories, and um, as as you said, that if there are already existing categories, then just might as well add to it. Uh, but maybe we also could think about it from the perspective of a process of categorization itself this idea that took okay, for a film festival or competitions to actually have categories and this process of categorization itself is a kind of a, a response to productivity is a response to excellence as you said winners and losers so uh, even if we are not thinking about uh, categories in the sense of gendered or ethnic or racial identities just the idea that okay, a best film in itself is a call to a certain kind of excellence so we are in a way formulating or reproducing that kind of uh, neoliberal, uh, um, the neoliberal uh, productivity model or the neoliberal excellence model, which is what the point of the whole question of, okay, how to decentralize and how to kind of restructure structures uh, comes in. But just thinking about this, maybe a question that I could pose is uh, based on something that Tanya, you were talking about and uh, uh, what what we, we were talking about uh, regarding um, this this nexus of neoliberalism, uh, class, and trade unions? Uh, how do we kind of situate ourselves in this nexus of productivity? If even those institutions or infrastructures that are designed to champion our causes, for example, like trade unions, aren't really designed for us as uh, BIPOC or people of color, uh, individuals or communities. And that's also another kind of uh, outside the uh, institutional critique model, because these are now trade unions are also organizations that we kind of imagine to be working for us. But if they don't end up representing us completely, if 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 it's not uh, a trade union, if it's not a union for say writers in English or poets in a foreign language, where do we go? How do we operate? And what new structures can we create, both outside of uh, the film industry, but also within it? That's maybe what my question is. <laughs> Don't have to answer it. No question. <laughs> Does anyone want to take this? Uh, do you need a microphone? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're you're absolutely right. I think when we uh, when there was this uh, big article in Helsinki somewhat maybe a few years ago about uh, about cleaners in the Greater Helsinki region, I. I might be wrong, but I didn't hear anything from from any labor union that they didn't do. They didn't do any kind of like, okay, we have to like loosen our rules of how how do you get in, like how do you get included. We have to like give this information when you come here, like something, you know, something. Uh, so, and if you look at who run uh, who who are who are running trade unions, it's it's very wide. It's it's extremely wide. It's uh, e extremely language dependent. It's entirely in Finnish. So sure, of course, like trade unions. Are not like catering to uh, catering to to everyone. Uh, absolutely not. Um, 
I think the answer is that uh, the union should do some legwork. They should like reach out to people and figure out what they are doing wrong. What, why, and and for example, this is that I can't like whenever like uh, anybody ask me like so what union I should join. I don't, I don't know. And I think this is a matter of like horizontal unity. Like why are and this, just say something very quick, quickly. But I, I want to like really really say that we need. A, a union for precarious workers, and B, we should like understand that hairdressers and sound designers and artists are all fighting the same battle. And I hear this so much from my friends who have like gotten a better job, and they like they don't like see themselves as workers anymore. That I don't have a boss because I'm this like creative whatever. And I'm like, nah, <laughs> you have a boss. Of course. Like, what are you talking about? And I think we should like this is something that I personally believe in that people should just rem remember uh, that there are like things that unite us, you know to a lot of different categories, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. But uh, but at the same time, we have to admit that unions, uh, I can you know I can testify that unions are not doing the work they should be doing. At the same time, I think they're doing a lot of fantastic things, but in, in this you know area, like not at all, okay. sadly. And in the context of filmmaking, I would say that it's uh, very challenging in the sense that it involves too many people and too many organizations to begin with. So this. Uh, uh, ways of reaching out, communication. Also, wanted to uh, add as an observation that I see how communication and mediation has not really been a part of uh, the film education curriculum, which is uh, which creates problems to begin with uh, in further uh, uh, com um, um, setting of uh, ideas and space uh, in one's professional lives. And this is something that we should be maybe uh, um, as a first and simple point uh, uh, underline that this kind of education should be part of uh, anyone's works when they have to be uh, involved with a multitude of people in their professional lives. Uh, what was I about to say, yes, that uh, apart from um, uh, communicating with a uh, uh, vast number of uh, people, uh, institutions uh, into several stages of production and being careful not to mix things up or not to do things in an order that it's not um, uh, in favor of the progress of uh, the work, and again, progress is a term that it might be problematic on its own. Yes, and uh, I may be quoting one festival director here, I'm not remembering, I don't remember who exactly, that uh, they said that film is bound to capital and compromise, which I think summarizes quite a lot of uh, where struggles begin uh, from. Uh, but uh, maybe to slowly conclude the conversation for today, because I think we're running out of time. Uh, I think that there are uh, a vast spectrum of filmmakers globally who are uh, keen and uh, active in these topics and uh, with whom sooner or later we will cross paths. And slowly there can be a redistribution of, uh, I don't know, space, power, uh, influence, visibility and maybe other values that we don't uh, think of yet. Um, so you can, you have our names, you can reach out to us. Uh, my personal phone number is on the Finnish Film Foundation's website, so you can <laughs> certainly reach out to me. <laughs> but yes, thank you for being part of this. Thank you to all the panelists and uh, contributors of the publication. Thank you to all of those who joined in the space and for those who joined online. And uh, we hope to uh, continue with uh, writing and publishing and sharing and discussing in this context or in another context. And uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.